Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us for this March 8th, 2023 meeting of the Capital Area Architecture and Planning Board. I'm really grateful for all of you bearing with the rescheduling and making time uh, for another meeting soon after, so soon after we met in January. Um, but the fun never stops on the cap board. Um, so I now call this meeting uh, to Good order. afternoon, everyone. This Thank is now you so our much. third hybrid board meeting. And per our recent practice, it is again live streamed on the board's YouTube channel where a recording will remain available uh, following the meeting. With remote participants, we will continue with roll call votes um, for official board actions. Uh, I would like to first start by recognizing uh, member James Garrett Jr., who was elevated in February to the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows. Yes. Um, an award awarded to architects who have made significant contributions uh, to the profession. So congratulations. We know that uh, we're very lucky to have you on. We knew before, but now we really know uh, to have you here. Yes. I'm also pleased uh, to uh, welcome a new board member, Representative Isaac Schultz, who is with us, uh, who joins Representative Cleborne as the second House member appointed by the Speaker to serve on our board. We will get to know uh, you through a more formal uh, introduction as we establish Quorum. Um, his appointment also means a departure of Representative Freiburg, whose service on the board uh, we have appreciated this past biennium. Um, we have been able to work together uh, when I was in the House and you were working for the House and now you're a House member, so I'm super happy to have you here. Uh, welcome, Representative. Um, I'm also glad to welcome a new architectural advi uh, advisor, uh, Joe Favor, who's been appointed by the State Arts Board uh, to provide advice. Uh, Mr. Favor, would you like, would you care to uh, introduce yourself? I'll just say hello. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. We're grateful uh, to have you uh, to have you there. Executive Secretary, can you also please facilitate a quick introduction of the other advisors and staff who are with us today? Yes. So we have Advisor Michael Bjornberg here with us at the table, and we have Advisor Danita Lemon, who is online with us virtually today. Uh, we have Principal Planner and Zoning Administrator Peter Musty here with us, and Laura Dotson, our part-time office assistant, is with us virtually managing things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since we have a lot to get through in short time today, I will forego a fun intro prompt, which we usually have. Rarely have we usually have fun intros, but so I'm glad <laughs> that you're here, but you have to come to another one. Um, intro prompt for the roll call uh, to establish a quorum. Uh, for a few new folks here today, please just also briefly introduce yourself in addition to your uh, board of service. So we'll start with Representative Schultz and then go in uh, alphabetical order. Representative. Thank you. Um, I'm Isaac Schultz. I represent House District 10B in Central Minnesota. Uh, the largest city of my district is in Malacca, 2,900 people, to give you an idea of where my district is. Uh, my family has uh, lived here in Minnesota for 150 years when we settled in the same township that I live, which is Elmdale Township. And uh, I'm excited to be on the cap board, especially given my previous services staff for the House of Representatives, uh, where the Lieutenant Governor and I had the chance to work together. So uh, very much looking forward to our work and excited, especially following the conversations that I've had with my House colleague, Representative Cleborn, as well as with, with Merrick. So I'm excited for this. Thank you. Welcome. All right, uh, Ms. Badger. Present, former Commissioner of Administration twice and member of the um, Capital Innovation Commission. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Kate Bean. Oh, who's not here today. Uh, Ms. Belton. Good afternoon, Alicia Belton. I am uh, serving on my second term um, with the CAT board, so I'm pleased to be able to do that um, in my day job. I am also an architect, so welcome to the new members in here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hills. Hi, I'm Hannah Hills. Um, I am appointed by the mayor as a community representative, and uh, my day job is caring for my children, one of whom is here today. If you hear him, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's perfect. <laughs> and uh, just a constant reminder that our role is to care for this capital, to care for this area for future generations. So thank you for the assist. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Garrett, you're here. Yes, uh, James Gear Jr., uh, mentioned part of the formula of architects, and was appointed by the mayor to uh, help keep an eye on Capitol Hill and all things uh, interesting taking place up here. So. Our representative Cleborn. 
Press that issue. Your title tells everybody what to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Mr. McLean. Here, uh, Senator Nelson, Senator Pappas, Steve that is just fine. All right, and uh, Mr. Yang, I'm here with folks, Daniel Yang, uh, St. Paul Mayor, Mel Thank you. And with that, uh, in addition to myself, a quorum is present. Um, our first uh, substantive uh, item this afternoon is a presentation of the state office building project. Members, last Friday, you received a series of slides, including on the, uh, the proposed improvement and expansion of the building. These are also posted on our board's website. We will start with a presentation to provide an overview of the project. Uh, Eric Rodell from the Department of Administration is also here and will begin uh, the present with the presentation. Yeah, I just was going to do a summary slide. Wonderful. Good. Let's go. Go ahead, uh, Executive yeah. Secretary. Uh, before we hear on the presentation, just so the board's grounded in what the upcoming steps are going to be, uh, we have staff and advisors actively working with the design team. And we're going to be meeting weekly to help refine plans for the exterior of the building and the open spaces around the addition. Uh, Peter Musty is going to be preparing a project review framework that he'll present to the board at the next meeting. And staff are also reviewing uh, the comprehensive plan and the potential of compliance with the project and will be making a recommendation to the board in April. And at that time, the board must vote on whether or not it finds that the project is consistent with the comprehensive plan. So today we're just asking board members to listen to the presentations on the renovation, the proposed expansion and related comprehensive planning issues. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board. Um, I am Eric Riddell with the Department of Real Estate and Construction Services. Um, I have Joel Stallman here from MOCA, Dan Hottinger from BWBR, the our design team, and then joining us online. Bridge. Right. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the state office building renovation project with you. The presentation we are about to give is a shortened version of the previous presentation that was given to the House Rules Committee. I will address the need for renovation. Mr. Stallman will address the process and programming. And lastly, Mr. Hottinger and Mr. Coverage will review the proposed improvement and expansion. The current condition of the state office building creates many vulnerabilities. Next slide. The state office building has several needs. Some of these needs include, but are not limited to, outdated building infrastructure, security concerns, limited access for individuals with disabilities, inadequate space for public participation, inadequate space for staff, and life safety system concerns. Next slide. The state utilizes a rule-based assessment tool called the FCA, or Facility Condition Assessment. This assessment is a comprehensive review of all major building components. The FCAs are conducted by assessors who undergo extensive training. Next slide, please. Each FCA, each facility is assigned a value of one to five. Uh, one being the lowest, five being the highest. As FCA score is entered, and an FCI, or Facility Condition Index, is assigned to the building. The FCA provides a readily available tool for maintenance prioritization. The FCA is a standardized management tool used by federal, state, and local governments. The last state office building FCA was conducted in 2020. Next slide. FCI scores range from excellent, good, fair, poor, and crisis. Next slide. Some items in the state office building that are in fair condition, a reminder that the scoring is from 2020, so two years ago. Basement and exterior walls, several signs of cracking and water intrusion. Exterior, next slide, sorry. Uh, exterior windows, apologies, in poor condition. The windows are energy inefficient, and there's signs of water intrusion, and the thermal brakes are failing and the exterior structural steel is corroding. Next slide, please.
exterior doors are in fair condition, the seals are failing, frames are rusting, and they are energy inefficient. Next slide. Roof coverings are in poor condition. The terracotta tiles are loose and cracked, and the roof has noted leaks over the past few years. Slide. Interior ceilings are in fair condition. Several suspended and hard ceilings are in need of repairs and or replacement. Next slide. Plumbing systems are in poor condition due to age and are currently insufficient for modern low flow fixtures. Next slide. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems are currently in poor condition. They are energy efficient, prone to failures, have temperature control issues, and are a constant threat of leaks. Next slide. Electrical and lighting systems are in fair condition. They are currently energy inefficient, and the electrical infrastructure is at capacity. Next slide, please. Interior finishes are in fair condition due to age, wear, and tear. Next slide. Fire alarm system or the life safety system is in poor condition. Excuse me, sorry, in fair condition, I can correct myself. Uh, the infrastructure wireling and field, the field devices are nearly 40 years old and outdated. Next slide. <laughs> So these items contribute to the state office building having an FCI rating of 0.27. This puts the building into the poor fair range. The state office building is the worst FCI rated building on the Capitol complex. Next slide, please. All right, next slide, yeah, something like that. All right. So, without major renovation of the state office building, risk of catastrophic failures will continue, most notably the major water event of 2016 and continued events throughout the present day. Next slide, please. Again, just some reference pictures for the 2016 flood. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next. Next slide. Lastly, some of the building occupants are working in spaces that are not intended to be work areas, but spaces, but space constraints in the building have led staff to make do. This is resulting in poor air quality, insufficient ventilation, and the ability, inability to control temperatures properly that could lead to safety and health concerns for staff. Next slide. Yeah, so reference material. Next slide, please. Mr. Stallman, I turn it over to you. Madam Chair and Board Members, thank you. My name is Joe Stallman with the company called Mocha. Uh, we are owners representatives for the project. I'm lucky enough to know some of you from past projects. We've been served in the same role uh, for the state capital restoration, as well as the design and construction of the Senate building. Uh, we uh, responded to a competitive public RFP about a year ago, and I'm going to talk to you very quickly about what we've been doing over the last year, and then we'll get to design, which I know you want to see. Next slide, please. Um, we went through a workshop process very similar to what we did at the Capitol. So any of you that were there for that, it was much like that process. It was from June through September, uh, and we included all the tenant groups in the building and tried to really learn and listen to them about what their needs are, what the deficiencies of the building are, and uh, how they could better operate in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, again, that was with partisan and nonpartisan groups, uh, elected members, staff, uh, department heads, and uh, we had periodic check-ins with leadership as well as a, a subcommittee of uh, elected officials. Next slide, please. This is what the workshop looks like uh, in process, and this is in one of our uh, committee rooms that really wasn't designed to be a committee room uh, when the original building was built. Next slide uh, is another view of that. Next slide, we'll uh, show you the member involvement uh, on both sides of the aisle. We have uh, six representatives that we met with as well as leadership. Next slide. And what we were doing is kind of bring them up to speed on the workshop process. It started with a visioning workshop where we asked everyone to talk about their values and principles. Uh, we were trying to hone in on what the main goals of the project would be. Next slide. Um, what we landed on were these four core values. The first two, uh, 
want to take a moment to slow down. Safety and security was one of them, as well as open and accessible. So those two, those two items are, are sort of in conflict with each other, and our design team has a, a big task ahead of them to try to uh, understand how to meet both of those needs. How do you keep the building safe, but also open to the public? Uh, in addition to that, we uh, identified the function, the functionality within the building, as well as the character. Next slide. I'm going to talk really quickly about the eight workshops. I'm just going to tell you about what the what the subject matters were, and that led us to the program. Workshop one was just kind of getting our feet wet on, on how the project would go as far as laser scanning, preservation zones, uh, understanding how files would be shared. Workshop two then was uh, focused on committee rooms and conference rooms and meeting and support spaces. I alluded to the fact that uh, committee rooms were not an original part of the design. This building in 1932 had uh, large uh, atriums that allowed natural light down into the center of the building. Those were filled in the 1980s, and that's where all the committee rooms are. So those are an afterthought to the design. Uh, workshop three then uh, talked about the offices circulation and that natural light, as you see there. And and how do you uh, how do you walk? How do you get to these offices? How does the public approach these offices? Next slide. Workshop four. Uh, was safety, life, sa uh, life safety, security, and accessibility. We talked about those in all of the workshops, but uh, we did take one to really hone in on that, that aspect. Workshop five was uh, what we call MEP, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Workshop six was then telecom and broadcast. Workshop seven was kind of the last working workshop where we talked about FFN, as we say, uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, which led us to a uh, meeting for workshop eight. By this time now, we had a good list of what the needs were uh, for the building, if, uh, according to all the tenants. Now, we were all hired thinking that this was a restoration of the building proper. And when we got done with this at the end of September and into October, we realized that the needs for the building uh, were quite a bit more than what would fit back in the building. So this slide shows you some of the square footages. The second one here gives you a total at the bottom of 456,000 uh, square feet is the need. And uh, the, the existing building right now is only 280,000 square feet. There, the architects took over on design and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dan and Preston. Thanks, Joe. Um, so as Joe covered in the workshop section, um, really what, one of the things we did early on was trying to identify the goals, the values, and the guiding principles for the overall project. So, and then those jointly served as guideposts, if you will, for the for the design as we moved through. So collectively, the workshop process identified the core values for the project that we use, secure and safe, right? So um, security and safety for the public who are coming into the building and, and interacting with government, for the staff that need to work in the building uh, year round, and then the members, uh, the house members who are coming in and not only interacting with the public, but also interacting with their staff. Um, open and accessible. So easy wayfinding, the building should be welcoming to the public, but secure, which is very difficult to balance to, to match. We, we had the same thing on the Senate building. I'm sure there was a same Capitol building as on zero. But also accessibility features that don't exist within the building today to make sure that there is a, um, the, the, the building is inclusive for everything. Functional, functional spaces are paramount to the building, right? Um, we want to make sure that there are functional spaces for work, there's functional spaces for, for public interaction, and that to have the max, maximize the daylighting to bring the daylight into the building and make the building more pleasant for everybody to be in while they're there. Character uh, of the building is very important, obviously, on the Capitol Mall. It should be dig distinguished, it should be dignified. However, it should not be ostentatious, it should not be, uh, it should not turn away or uh, be uninviting to the public who is coming to the building. So, um, 
taking those key planning elements and applying that to the plan. So we have the building where we have accessibility for everyone. Uh, taking the uh, main entry, if you will, and pushing that north onto the addition so that we have entry points at grade so that uh, a person um, can come in at grade rather than having to go into the south or through the revolving doors on a, a flight of stairs at the street level now. Um, on the west entrance, there would be a turnaround and a drop off for people to be dropped off and can come directly to the building with accessible parking right off the entry drive. On the east side, it provides that connection back to the Capitol as people are going back and forth to the Capitol building. And also by pushing the entry north uh, off of the existing building, it, it makes it a little it makes it a little closer to the Rice Street uh, uh, train station. And in addition, uh, the bus stop is right across from the Minnesota City. So having uh, a closer access for people who are using public transportation for is also also on the on the on micro level that has to be accessible to all also applies to the rooms themselves so right now the committee rooms and the hearing rooms are are not meeting ada obviously um but you know it's it's the little things like making sure there's proper spacing making sure that the seating mix is, is proper for the people who are coming in from the public and uh just features like hearing aid loops in the floors for before people who come in intuitive wayfinding. As you see here, we have kind of a central core and hubs that we have in the building. So the central core may, gives you easy access to the committee hearing rooms, to the uh, to the vertical transportation, right? The stairs, the elevators that get people up and down in the building, and also that provide that central like, core that goes down making the building and easy to get through. Um, but also, in addition to that, having ample space outside of the hearing rooms for the waiting for the outing and then for the transition period when you're done with the hearing and people are going out and around, making sure that there's enough room for the people to use to okay. Integrated safety, uh, Joe had mentioned this before. This is one that, that we always struggle with. Um, obviously, it's a building of the people. You want the building to be as open and inviting as possible, but we also want to have the ability to react to emergencies or to provide the safety and security for the folks who work there, the public who come in. So the security and safety that design is going to be integrated into the building to be as unobtrusive as possible to the to the public who are coming into the building and to the staff who use it every day and to the members as they flow through to their different appointments during the day. So it, it's big picture items like uh, up at the top of the building, we're going to have the air intake so that the airflow for the building uh, cannot be uh, tampered with. But it's also the day-to-day -day thing, uh, like having an, a fully integrated card reader system so that at or say, for instance, at five o'clock, the building could be uh, the building that would be time to shut down for when the building is closed, if you will. And then in certain areas become uh, go into uh, a lockdown status so that you don't have um, public who should not be in certain office areas wandering through for those people who are working into the evening uh, during. Uh, but also that. Carburetor system also gives the capital security and gives the secretary, excuse me, gives me the sergeant at arms uh, the ability that in an emergency situation they can lock down parts of the building or the entire building to address and deal with the situation. So this is where um, I will hand it off to Preston Gumbridge with our project partner, Ramza, and he's going to walk us through the site development during the SD phases. Great. Thanks, Dan. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, at least virtually. Um, I'm here in New York City, of course, um, and it's a great honor and a pleasure to present the work that we've been working on so diligently and collaboratively now over many months. And I must add, um, since we're looking at the overall site plan of a good chunk of the capital district um, that um, the 2040 comprehensive plan was and still is um, a touchstone for us um, as we develop the design um, and the <clears throat> proposed addition and also the proposed uh, grounds that will um, surround the addition. Um, so here you see um, uh, the Capitol Mall, uh, 
pretty much as it stands. Next. And um, again, sort of quoting from the 2040 comp plan, um, there is a very defined front yard to the Capitol. And I must add, um, I'm a New Yorker, but I have to say, um, you folks in Minnesota have truly one of the most beautiful state capitals that I've ever seen. Um, and you should be very, very proud of it. Um, and we respect that, um, certainly, um, as we move forward in this process. Um, but the front yard is the primary place for Minnesotans to gather, um, express themselves, and commemorate. And we understand that. We also understand that there are other spaces, perhaps not as monumental in scale as that front yard, um, that also um, deserve attention um, around the Capitol Mall. Next. Um, so uh, in any project we work on, we start to do a site analysis, and this is certainly no exception. Um, so we looked at the Capitol and everything sort of radiates around the Capitol building, uh, the primary cross axes, north, south, and east, west. Next. And also, um, of course, there are secondary um, avenues, um, John Ireland and Cedar Street um, coming in at diagonals, but again, focusing on the dome, on the main entry um, of the Capitol and a sort of circular um, uh, circumference um, that radiates also around the Capitol dome um, and defines the mall. Next. And we also, being the firm that we are, we do look backwards um, in history, the history of the site. And of course, Cass Gilbert didn't just design the Capitol, he designed the whole Capitol plan and district, um, at least as he saw it should be. Um, and so we know that um, to the west and to the east of the Capitol, um, he had imagined that there would be some sort of defined green space or parks um, that would um, border uh, the Capitol itself. Um, next. And so um, this is sort of taking um, what you have now and placing it over that capital plan of Cass Gilbert's to see how it actually materialized um, today. And there are green spaces, maybe not exactly the triangular proportions he was imagining, but nonetheless, they are there and they exist. And in fact, it's interesting to note that there is that diagonal axis um, uh, on our site that once was a street long, long ago. Next. And so we did some studies to look at the, compas the comparison of a green space, looking at the judicial center and its green space that faces the east side of the Capitol, and how, if that were mirrored, it would um, relate on the west side. Next. We also looked at the zoning of the state office building. And as we know, that's part, I think, of um, the agenda today um, to look at the rezoning of the G1 versus the G2 um, districts to allow for the expansion of the state office building to the north. Next. Um, so we also started to look at, and we think it's important, as I mentioned initially, uh, the green space um, around the Capitol, but also around the proposed uh, addition. So um, as it stands now, you see on the left-hand side of this slide, um, you have green space of about 2.2 acres, and that's taking into account the current surface parking lot that you have, um, which is accessed off of Rice Street. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see um, what would be the total amount of green space if you absorbed that uh, parking lot, um, and you would get about three point, a little under 3.2 acres there. Next. And so here you see um, a site plan which shows um, the state office building and the proposed annex um, extending to the north. And you can see that the green space, um, if you compare this to the existing green space, we've increased the green space by about 14,000 square feet. Um, or um, about a third of an acre, I believe, if my math is correct. 
Um, sorry. Um, and we did look at the comp plan here and sort of recite a chapter and verse a bit, um, looking at principle 2.30, which really refers to the redevelopment whenever possible of surface parking lots into green space. And so that's exactly what we propose to do here. Next. So the design, the proposed design, um, tried to make sure that it was uh, built around the guiding principles that you see here, the secure and safe, the open and accessible, the functional, the character of the building. But um, in addition to that, it was Preston went through that. We wanted to make sure that it meets the speed, the space needs program, which then prompted us to look at the addition for it. It responds to the capital access on the, on the site. The primary entrance sequence for the building um, is different and, and uh, anticipated to, to make it easier for the public to enter and exit the building. Defining the outdoor living space um, and then maximizing views and daylight. Obviously, a high relation to the, to the capital is is uh, is a tenant of the project. The building does, as shown, meet this uh, requirement. And then, you know, having a light touch on the existing building while separating the addition from the existing parking ramp. So the existing parking ramp at this time is not within the purview of this project and for being as is. Right, so I'll pick up from here. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, <laughs> do we need to go back or maybe this is okay? I can't hear you. Okay, anyway. Um, so here you see the proposed annex extending to the north of the state office building. Um, and uh, again, I mentioned the axes uh, from the Capitol building itself. And so the northern end of the proposed addition does respect and actually is on access, although set back from uh, MLK Boulevard, um, is on access with the west facade of the Capitol building. Next. Great. Okay, I think I can hear someone back there. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I had a technical difficulty there. Um, so here um, with the open green space, there are um, other aspects. The mobility hub, for example, would be off of Rice Street, uh, bus service. Um, next. Um, and we're proposing that there be zones of public space, and these are just proposals. I mean, we need to work that out very specifically, uh, but you can see that there's a green space or access across MLK Boulevard from the west facade, the steps um, to the Capitol. Um, also, there are uh, spaces to either side of Leif Bjergsen statue, and then also public space to the west of the proposed addition. Um, and again, which um, sort of is a major public space, perhaps, and also is just south of the um, light rail line. Next. Um, as Dan mentioned before, um, this building, at least the addition itself, has two major entrances. The west entrance is uh, primarily a vehicular drop-off point or access point. Then the east is the formal, if you will, um, main entrance, pedestrian entrance from the Capitol. And very important to this project, because I know in the existing state office building, um, light is at a premium, um, but this project is intended to be very light, open and inviting um, in its own way as a public building. 
uh, to provide natural light deep into the building and also to provide capital views for the public um, in the spaces, public spaces, which um, surround the perimeter of the building, certainly on the east end and north ends of the project. And also the green space is important. And so while you have light and views, you also have views and access to that green space all around. Um, we also are respectful, again, looking at the comp plan of the height of the building and the cornice of the proposed addition lines up with the cornice of the existing state office building, um, which is less um, high than the existing cornice and balustrade of the Capitol building. Um, in fact, the roof midpoint um, lines up with the top of the balustrade. So it is uh, in deference, certainly in massing and height to the Capitol building. Next. Um, I think as Dan had mentioned before, uh, it is a light touch that we propose um, to uh, attach to the state office building. We see the state office building as a historic building with its own importance. Um, and so we're mindful of that and don't want to overdo it. Next. And I think as Dan had mentioned before as well, uh, while the parking ramp is not currently in our scope, we are mindful and respectful of the entrances and exits to it. And so our proposed vehicular access drive on the west allows access straight into that parking ramp. Next. Um, this is an aerial view of the addition and the existing state office building and its reconfigured configuration. Um, you can see um, you can see that major data lines, as I mentioned, um, are carried through. Next. And perhaps more importantly, the perspective view from the west side of the Capitol steps you see on the lower portion of this slide probably tells the story better. Um, the materials are a continuation of the Cold Spring granite that's on the existing building. Um, also the terracotta tile roofs, the same material. So there's a continuity of materials across the capital complex. That's the intention here. Um, and you can see, unlike the state office building, which has fairly small windows, we're proposing large and generous windows um, in all these public spaces that um, certainly face east, as well as the office space to provide plentiful light, but also to be a sort of transparent view into um, the government. So you can see behind the windows, on the right-hand side of the lower portion of the slide, um, some of the proposed hearing rooms and how large those windows are and how you get a view of government in action, certainly, this vantage point. And you can see, uh, I don't need to recite the chapter and verse, but the various elements within the comprehensive plan that we are mindful of and um, propose in this project. Next. And, and lastly, the, the, the rendering itself, as I had mentioned before, um, this shows the proposed entryways and access points and security bollards around the perimeter, everything that you know, we've certainly learned from the comp plan and intend to incorporate here. Thank you, Preston. Uh, just real quick for everybody, just the uh, the schedule that we are at right now. We are currently in design development phase, uh, February through May. Uh, we will be uh, looking to construction document phase, May through September, with bid packages um, and issuance of the GMP in August of 23. Bidding phase, August through September of 23. Financing, September through October of 23. And construction start, December of 23 through December of 26. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board. Very much. Um, so thank you all. Uh, this leaves us uh, with a, a few minutes for questions um, or comments from the design team. Uh, members, would any of you like to hear uh, you know, either anything related to the, the presentation or other materials provided. Just want to give folks an opportunity here. If not, I think you've all had the opportunity to look at the 
materials. Very thorough, um, quick with a lot of information, uh, but also very uh, thorough uh, presentation. So our next piece here uh, is uh, a key underpinning of the board's review of this project is its fit with the 2040 comprehensive plan for the capital area we adopted in June of 2021. Today is an opportunity to begin thinking about this topic, and then we will likely need to return later this spring to make a final determination. If the board determines that the project complies with the plan, then additional work related to zoning and design will follow. The board staff have prepared some initial analysis to help start your thinking on this issue in a memo, which is posted on the board website and has been distributed uh, by email. Um, Ms. Clapsmith, uh, can you please go ahead with your overview? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I want to just note that because of the timeline, moving very quickly, we're going to be pursuing a dual track review. Uh, so simultaneously with doing the analysis of compliance with a comprehensive plan for the project, which we would present to the board at a meeting, um, we will be working with the design team on refining plans. Uh, so we'll be doing those concurrently as we go forward. I'm going to skip our comprehensive plan slide here. And as we think about the comprehensive plan, um, I want us to think about kind of a project view and then a larger context. We're not restricted to evaluating compatibility based only on the building design and the addition itself. We can also think about the full picture of things happening in relation to the project. In the following slides, I will introduce themes of the comprehensive plan that we'll want to consider for the project and a few questions under each. Uh, staff and advisors are beginning a deeper analysis of compatibility and we will present that to the board at its next meeting. Um, in the meantime, we encourage you to think. And I want to pause just for one moment because I missed um, asking to yield time momentarily to our advisor, Michael Bjornberg. Uh, the advisors work closely with staff during all of this, uh, and this has been proceeding a little differently than projects normally would, and, and advisor Bjornberg is asked to share a few comments on that. Thank Very you, well. Madam Chair, members of the board. I appreciate your allowing time for cap board advisory commentary. Uh, these comments are reflective of the advisors and through discussions with the cap board staff. The cap board or advi nor advisors or, and advisors were excluded from involvement in the project formulation and programming discussions for the first six months. This runs counter to all other work within the capital complex and formally agreed upon procedures that have typically been used for years. This then brings us to a moment in time where we find ourselves in a project that has overgrown its site. It's architecturally pretentious for its locale and is consumed space devoted to public use. The proposed state office building expansion proposes to use land that is known as public land for the expansion. This is land that has been formally used and informally by the public for many uses. It's the only space on the capital complex in proximity to the capital within eye view of all branches of the state government, legislative, executive, and judicial. It is alone in that aspect. It provides a wayfinding moment to all those arriving by LRT and driving east on University Avenue to see the, see the state capitol and the capitol mall of the grant space that is. Vistas were a fundamental design element of Haskell. He was passionate and persistent about the development of key vistas to and from the state capitol. My review of his letters and sketches in the historical archives reveals a strong commitment and request for vistas and open spaces to enhance the capitol and provide for public space. The expansion also blocks off the key Aurora Avenue access that we have noted in the comp plan as a key vista. In the renovation of the state capitol, there was great interest and and great interest and commitment by the state to provide a welcoming people's house. The amount of and access to that public space reinforced that commitment to provide access. The state office building expansion proposal goes against the great accomplishments of providing better access by the public by eroding and blocking off all connections to a significant public space on the capital complex. Given the building's location adjacent to the capital and its function as a building that should most represent the working class of Minnesota, the architectural expression is overly stated. We oppose the state office building expansion in its current configuration for the following reasons. 
the blatant exclusion of the cap board in planning of this project and the lack of public involvement. The elimination of public land that has been used by many to enjoy their views, the park-like atmosphere, it just feels like land grabbing. The loss of this gathering place also eliminates the visibility to state lawmakers and people's access to the process that affects it. Again, I repeat, it's the only public space on the mall, visible by all three branches of the state government. I am doubtful there has been due diligence in looking at a programmatic prioritization of project elements that can reduce the extent of movement into that public space. The substitution of additional park space away from the Capitol is a safety concern. It develops an undesirable and fractured gathering areas around highly traffic intersection with multiple traffic modes, including LRT, bus, automobile, emergency vehicles, and could put pedestrians at a high risk for injury. Given that the design team has been given direction to proceed with this design and the role of the cap board is to challenge projects to be their best, we have requested to be involved in the ongoing development of this project and provide our expertise as is our charge and due diligence as we have on all our other developments in this area. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to now run through quickly uh, topics we have to think about for the comprehensive plan. And the first one we want to turn to is open space. Uh, because there's a loss of open space from the addition, uh, the design team and house leadership next one, please. Uh, looked at, are there opportunities to create new open space in the area so that there would be a no net loss of open space? So on the right hand image, you see um, two areas that have been suggested for consideration that would be open space added um, near the Rice University intersection and visible to uh, the state office building and Capitol. One is to the on the northeast corner of Rice and University and other is in the southwest. Um, ideas about these space are being actively considered and you'll be hearing more about those. But um, obviously those spaces would function differently than um, how Lee Harrison Park had been envisioned in the conference of plan. Uh, civic gathering. We have the tradition of Lee Harrison Park for civic gathering. So with an addition in place, how does the function of this space change? Will there still be opportunities, for instance, for people to come um, to have political rallies, which has been a tradition, prayer sessions, often um, in conjunction with stuff that's happening on the mall, so the opposing sides each have their space to express themselves. Um, so how do we balance this idea of having an open campus um, with working in this addition and still needing some of those principles? Uh, views to the Capitol building and mall, um, as Advisor Bjornberg mentioned, uh, views have always been considered an important part um, of the Capitol approach, particularly from the West. Uh, the addition will move into part of that space. So are there new ways that we can think about design around the addition that help with the experience of the stairs going up to the Capitol um, and approach from the mall? So um, we need to get really creative with design around the addition um, if we want to try to meet some of our comp plan objectives. Go ahead. We have the mobility hub, an important part of the comprehensive plan. Um, and I'm just going to note, I have a lot of words in these slides because people refer back to the slides to read them. So I don't expect you to read them all here. But the mobility hub was a really important part of the Leaf Erickson um, Park vision in the comprehensive plan. That would be a multimodal station area accommodating pedestrians, bicyclists, transit riders, making connections. Um, and I think we're optimistic in conversation with the design team and admin that we would still be able to do a mobility hub on the site. Okay. Community connections and vitality. This is where we really think about looking at the bigger picture of activities that could be catalyzed by this investment. What other things can happen in the area that would really help advance our comprehensive plan objectives. Um, transitions between the community and the campus 
a sense of welcome. Uh, and this is just an image uh, from the Reconnect Rondo, where it's re-envisioning an, an intersection a little bit of a ways from here. But if you think about Rice and University now, I think there are a lot of opportunities to kind of change the feel and design of that so that people feel like it's easier to move between the campus and our community. All right, potential changes to the project context. So thinking of the bigger picture, um, we will be doing hopefully an update of our Capitol Mall framework plan. This looks at all open spaces around the Capitol Mall and campus. And it's a really important opportunity coming up to really dig deep into thinking about new open spaces that might be added. Um, we're thinking about improvements along the Rice Street corridor. The comprehensive plan had had a vision for narrowing that corridor, making it easier to cross. We definitely want to keep thinking about that. Um, upgrading the connectivity, as I mentioned, between the campus and the Capitol Rice area. And then just mobility, safety, wayfinding. And are there other opportunities? So shifting from the comprehensive plan piece, if the addition is going to go forward, um, it would be going into land that currently is only allowed under zoning for open space. So we would need to do a rezoning to allow the addition to move forward. A rezoning under uh, cap board and state processes is a rulemaking. Um, and rulemaking typically take, I mean, really is a fast track. Six or seven months is very, very fast. So even though we aren't at a point yet where the board has decided whether or not it finds the project to be compatible with the COP plan, which would be grounds for rezoning, um, we're recommending that we reinitiate the rulemaking, initiate the rulemaking process now, knowing that at any point the board can withdraw the rulemaking procedures and not go ahead with the rezoning. But particularly this first 60 days, it's the first of two opportunities for public comment on the ideas of rezoning. And um, we would like to get those going right away so that we can then move through the other phases of rulemaking and have a decision um, that's consistent with the timeline for uh, these guys going to the bond market in the fall. Okay. All right, that was it for me. Um, maybe go back. So any any questions, or I know we're running tight, but you can always follow up with me afterwards too. Was that a lot? <laughs> I think um, we were overconfident in our ability to get through this meeting in an hour, but I appreciate the flexibility um, of everyone. And Samira, thank you so much for running through that. I uh, just want to open it up. Are there any questions that folks have at this, this moment? Um, there are opportunities uh, to pause along the way, uh, but this is, is needed to at least uh, get the, the process started. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to come to Ms. Hills and then Ms. Patrick. Oh, um, thank you so much for all of the information. I really appreciate it um, being able to read through so much before this meeting and then hearing it firsthand as well. Um, I have a lot of questions and I will not take everyone's time to ask all of them, but I would like to start by saying I think there will be some sensitivity from a community perspective about the bypassing of the cap procedure. Um, when I started looking at it, uh, my initial thought was, wow, I wish I had legislative power to be able to put a garage on my house because that's that's what my initial um, interaction with Peter had been. Um, understanding the zoning <laughs> that goes on with putting, putting things on your property. Um, so I would appreciate some more understanding from the legislative perspective about why that happened and if it can be avoided in the future. Because um, I think we're here, we're all here to care for this this complex. And I think it's important that procedures are followed. So, thank you. Well, said, Ms. Hills and I would uh, invite our legislative partners uh, to uh, share some of uh, 
their thoughts and perspective as well. I won't put it on both of you to represent the entire <laughs> body, um, but I do think that there's an opportunity for that. And I think that that's, uh, that's a fair, fair question. Yeah. Ms. Badra. Yeah, Madam Chair and the board, um, we've been presented with a ton of information. Yes. And it's a fire hose. Yeah. I really want to, first of all, applaud CAP board staff for trying to find a way through to get us to a point where this project can move forward in a way that does not violate the plan. But I, I for one, have, as, as does Ms. Hills, have a ton of questions. And I, I worry that our next meeting will be a vote of yay or nay in terms of whether this meets the plan. And we won't have, have had the time to think about it and review the discussion. I'm wondering if we possibly could schedule another meeting that is a little more liberal in terms of timing and the ability to ask questions. I know we're already past 10 minutes past. And so, um, Madam Chair, what is, that? is that a possibility? What I would what I would suggest we do today, you can take my suggestion or leave it, is that I do believe that today we do need to proceed with um, the rulemaking process. Um, I would also say that I think we have an opportunity where we can have an additional meeting. And I would I would perhaps call it something like a study session yes. um, uh, in order to dig in here and to have a more robust uh, conversation to really give ourselves that time. I would also suggest uh, that that would be an opportunity, uh, an opportunity for our legislative partners to come and speak a little bit to about um, uh, about these changes, why they're needed. We certainly, you all did a wonderful job. Um, uh, we certainly can see that, but I do think um, uh, there's an important perspective of both legislators and staff who have been in these buildings, um, and uh, and there the need for uh, those changes. Does that? It does absolutely. And I was actually prepared to move that we go forward with the, the rezoning with, Wonderful. with the process of, of rulemaking because we we don't have any time to waste. Um, so I that is completely compliant with what I was thinking. Wonderful. I think we all. You know, use the study session. Yeah. I'm going to come to Mr. Yang and then back to Ms. Hills. Sure. Just wanted to know very briefly that the mayor uh, and, and staff uh, have had the opportunity to talk to both legislative partners and CAP board and um, supportive of the project and really appreciative of the accessibility uh, inside the building. Um, and again, very supportive of the project, but also shares concerns about accessibility outside in the green spaces and, and around the building. And so I know we'll have plenty of time to have further conversations, but as design team folks are here, um, incredibly important to make sure that we maintain the accessibility that we're striving for inside. And so we are around. The building. Thank you. Uh, just one more thing. Um, definitely see the need for something to change with the state office building. It's very obvious that it's in need of, of updates. Um, I just would request from the design team as someone who is not an architectural expert. Um, I've noticed based on past projects that I've looked at with the capital area that there's usually a lot of artistic license taken with renderings of what the space will look like. Um, so I just want to put it out as a community member and not as an architectural expert um, to be able to see a more realistic understanding of what things will be. Um, just as a quick example, uh, burying power lines versus having power lines. That makes a huge difference in the aesthetic of a space. So very simple, but it would go a long ways, I think, to, for people to understand what the space will be. So um, I don't speak for the speaker in any way, but I think it's important for the cat board to know that in my interactions with the speaker about this project, I have been um, very happy with the way she envisions vitality for the community and for her commitment to uh, Cass Gilbert's front lawn concept. She really does see the Capitol and the um, best and the state office building as public space and um, making sure that the public is front of mind in how they interact with the new building and how they interact with the capital space and the entire mall. I think we're very fortunate at this time in our history to have a speaker of the house who really does value um, the public and 
the public interaction with the government. So as I said, these are my words, they're not the speaker's words. It's the way that I hear her talk about public engagement. I'm interested in we're 10 minutes or almost 15 minutes past time. I would like to move that the, we authorize the executive secretary to proceed with rulemaking to rezone the property so that we can get that going. Thank you, Ms. Bowder. I'm sorry, second. Uh, is there any discussion? Additional discussion? Uh, with that, I will take the roll. Uh, Ms. Batro. Aye. Uh, Ms. Felton. Aye. Mr. Garrett. Aye. Ms. Hills. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Uh, Mr. McLean. Aye. Representative Schultz. Aye. Mr. Yang. Aye. And I, as the chair, also vote aye. Yes. So the motion uh, prevails. I am going to skip uh, the approval of the meeting minutes. We will add that to an additional uh, meeting. Um, I also, too, want to just echo, Ms. Badro, your praise for the staff. Um, you all have done an incredible job. Um, this has been uh, there's been a lot of grace, I think, through uh, through this process. I would uh, ask that we continue uh, to show a lot of grace uh, towards each other, remembering, I think, Representative Cleborn, if you said the public, the community, the neighborhood. Ms. Hills, that is exactly why you're here at this table, is to bring that perspective. And I always want to make sure that you feel like you can speak up. Um, this matters tremendously. Uh, we will all be in these roles for a very short period of time, as is related uh, to the beauty and the promise of uh, the capital and the surrounding uh, area. So we can do this with uh, great humility, great care, um, and uh, folks should feel seen and heard and valued as part of this process. So thank you, Executive Secretary and Mr. Rusty, for everything that you have done through this process. It has been a heavy lift. And Mr. Bloomberg, I hear you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and attention today. Um, it looks like we may be back for another meeting on April 21st. We can discuss as staff internally on the opportunity for a study session uh, in between. Um, uh, until then, I hope you all can give this project uh, some really good thought. Um, uh, and again, for staff, my team uh, would welcome any of your, uh, your thoughts and questions as well. So thank you very much uh, for this. Um, and we are adjourned. We did it. We graduated. All right. <laughs> And <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>